let's talk about one of the many third rails of um, discussions online, which is birth control. Yeah. And we need to define exactly what type of birth control we're talking about because there are so many different forms. Yes. There are IUDs, there are the copper IUDs, there's the ring, there's the, you know. Let's talk about oral contraceptives that are designed to prevent ovulation. Mm -hmm. So this is quote unquote the pill. Yep. So we're being, let's for now limit the conversation to that so that there isn't confusion. Um, share with us, if you will, your thoughts on these, how they impact any of the things that we're talking about or anything else from that, for that matter. Can we have another history lesson? Please. All right. Um, I just gave a talk at home to some young athletes on contraception because someone might be on the depot and if they're on it for more than two years, they get bone mineral density loss. So then the question of, okay, well, how does the oral contraceptive pill come up? How does that affect things? It's like, well, let's look at the history of it. Initially came from Stanford was funded by um, Catherine McCormick from McCormick family and a feminist activist, Margaret Singer. But because they were women, they couldn't get in the lab. So they got a guy from Stanford to develop the pill. And he's like, you know what? We need to put in a placebo week so that women feel like they're having a bleed. So if we're looking at the three active pills and then the one sugar pill week, it was by design to make women feel like they are having control over their menstrual cycle and they would still have a bleed. But it's not a true bleed, it's a withdrawal bleed. So this becomes the confusing point for people who are on an oral contraceptive pill. They're like, I get my period. It's like, no, you don't. Because the idea of the hormones that are in an oral contraceptive pill is to downregulate your ovarian function so that you don't ovulate. So you have a whole different hormone profile from someone who naturally cycles. So this depends on the type of oral contraceptive pill you are using. For the most part, monophasic is the one that's most prescribed. So that means the three weeks of the active pill is the same dose of estrogen and progesterone. And then you have your sugar pill week or your withdrawal week, and then you start again. When we look at the repercussions of using oral contraceptive pill in active women, there's a higher amount of inflammatory responses and oxidative responses. So from a training standpoint, no one's done the study yet, but I would be interested in doing this, of looking at how that impacts adaptation. You do end up with a new baseline of this when you start taking the pill, but we're not really sure how that impacts adaptation. We also look at the progestin component of the oral contraceptive pill, because we have four generations of progesterone. First generation was really high dose and has a lot of risk factors, not really prescribed that much. Second generation is the most prescribed. And this is the one that people just take. It's in your IUD, it's in your OC, uh, has the least amount of side effects. And then we have a third and a fourth generation. The fourth generation is primarily used for women who have really bad PMS or PMDD, which is your um, premenstrual dysphoria disorder. So significant mood issues because that progestin has a direct effect on a lot of the dopamine receptors in the brain as well. The third generation is very androgenic. So we see that in, in some preliminary research that improves speed and power by the second week of intake because it's accumulated. So when we're looking directly at an oral contraceptive pill, we can't make generalizations because you have low dose, high dose estrogen. We see that a 30 microgram dose increases hypertrophy, but not strength because estrogen increases the satellite cell aspect. Um, so for my power and Olympic athletes, Olympic lifting athletes, that's a detriment because they'll put on muscle mass, but no strength. So we've had to look at changing their OC or getting them off. For women who have breakthrough bleeding, that higher incidence of, or that higher intake of estrogen is, is really beneficial. So when we look overall at how it impacts women from an athletic standpoint, it's so variable in the hormone profile that we can't make generalizations. We only look at the very high performance athletes and what's happening up there because that can make or break an athlete. So from the general touch point, we don't know enough. Like the beginning of this year, 2024, there was a study that came out looking at changes in the amygdala that happens with oral contraceptive use. It's reversible in adults, but for young girls, we don't know because their brain is developing. 
And unfortunately, physicians will pass out OCs as if it's candy. OCs. Or a contraceptive. Or a contraceptive. And do you recall what the direction of the effect was on the amygdala? Uh, for those that uh, don't recall the amygdala, a bilateral brain structure, meaning one on each side of your brain. Uh, it literally means almond in Latin. It's almond-shaped. And it's part of a larger network associated with threat detection. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes it's described the locus of fear in the brain, but it's involved in a lot of other things too, yep. both positive valence and negative valence, but nonetheless is part of the um, threat detection system, uh, elevated levels of arousal, which is why it's often discussed in the context of fear, anxiety, et cetera. Uh, it increased fear in women who were on the OC or a contraceptive pill, made them less um, willing to take chances and when they went off it, they're like, well, why couldn't I do that before? So that's why they started looking at the amygdala. And when I say we're looking at young girls, and again, we don't know what's happening. Is it reversible in young girls that are put on it or not because of the brain structure changes that are happening? Um, so when we talk about an oral contraceptive pill, I want people to understand that it has a significant effect on the body not just reproductive. We don't know enough about all the other effects. So I have parents who say, my daughter wants to go on the oral contraceptive pill. She's having irregular periods. She's an athlete. We want to be able to control it. And it's like, if there's an issue with your menstrual cycle now, it's still going to be there when you get off it. So we have to look and see what what's going on here. If you're looking to get on it to control your menstrual cycle, why? Because we know that you can have an increase in your VO2 max and other ana anaerobic capacity when you are not on it. So you have a better top end capacity when you're not being blunted by these hormones. And then the other conversation is, oh, my skin. It's like, well, they have really good dermatologists that can help you with that. You don't have to go on an oral contraceptive pill. But unfortunately, GPs don't understand all of that. And if a girl comes in and says, I'm having irregular cycles, heavy menstrual bleeding, I want to go on the OC, there you go. So it is a huge conversation still be had. Um, I put it in the same category as menopause hormone therapy because there isn't enough research to address all the population needs. And we see these big pendulum switches. So before it was like, everyone be on the OC. And now it's like, maybe not. And then it was, no one be on menopause hormone therapy. Everyone should be on it. But we need to land in the middle and understand more of what's happening with these exogenous hormones. Is there any evidence that other forms of female contraception can be, let's just say, problematic for the types of things we're discussing today? Like the implant in the depot? Or IUD, copper IUD. Uh, copper IUD and the marina or, you know, your progestin-laced IUD, those are what a lot of my tactical athletes will use because it doesn't have a systemic effect on adaptation or inflammation, mood, any of those things. Um, and it's a fit and forget. So you can put it in for up to three to five years. If you have a really heavy bleeding, it really dissipates because the whole idea of an IUD is to thin the endometrial lining. And so then you have autophagy that takes care of the endometrial lining. So you don't necessarily have a bleed. The copper IUD is different because you do have really heavy bleeding for the first three cycles, and then it attenuates. 